Too much to gain. Many rivers. Many trails. Uh, too much to gain. I've crossed the hot burning desert, struggling the right road to choose. Somewhere up ahead, there's cool, clear water. And defeat is a word I don't use. Sing it now. Too many sunsets. sisters if you've been only saved for one week you can still sing it if you were saved yesterday <laughs> you can sing it let's lift our hands to Jesus give him an offering let's give him an offering that he will accept Amen. A worship offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I I was listening to a radio station on the internet and a um, couple days ago about a week ago and they were playing an old song an old song one uh, of my favorites fear thou not for I'll be with thee I will still thy pilot be Never mind the tossing billows. Hold my hand and trust in me. 
fear thou not, for I'll be with thee. I will still thy pilot be. Never mind the tossing billows. Praise God. 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 Thank you, Lord. Great presence of the Lord. Great, great presence of the Lord. Great presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Great presence of the Lord. Amen. It's wonderful, brethren. We didn't do anything to generate this presence of the Lord. It's nothing that we did. Thank you, Lord. I shall know Jesus, I shall know him, when redeemed, I shall I shall know him, I shall As redeemed by his son. I shall know him doesn't matter what Peter looks like doesn't matter what Gabriel looks like doesn't matter what Michael looks like I shall know him Let's walk around and just greet each other as we normally do.
Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to be in the house of God one more time with God's wonderful people. May grace and peace be multiplied. Those at the back are not hearing. Not hearing me at the back. Are you hearing me better now? Hearing me now. All right. All right. Um, I was saying that it's wonderful to be here one more time. Amen. And I I'm expressing the desire that grace and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ will be multiplied to you all. Amen. Uh, just before we begin, I want to just bring two passages of scripture to your attention. They are, they are some of my favorite passages. They have become very precious to me in the last maybe two or three years or so. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and the first three verses Paul writes and he says um, well a little background maybe would help the Corinthians had written to Paul and had raised some questions with him and part of the reason for him writing this letter was to try to answer some of the questions that they raised and one of the questions that they raised apparently was uh, how eating of meats offered to idols should be dealt with. So Paul says, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And you have to understand here that Paul is speaking somewhat sarcastically. He's, he's, he's saying, you know, you Corinthians, you behave as if you have the answer for everything. As we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity or love edifieth, builds up. You know that you can puff something up. That's what knowledge does if there is no love, but love builds up. It's easier to puff something up than to build it up. It's easier to puff up a balloon than to build a wall. But it doesn't take much for the air to come out of the balloon. It's, it's much more difficult to hit down a wall. And he says, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. So Paul says, what's important is not how much you know. What is important is, does God know you? See the spirit Paul comes with? And then, just a few pages 
over in chapter 13 chapter 13 this great uh, passage on love he says in verse 9 for we know in part and we prophesy in part we know in part and we prophesy in part and I am saying to myself if Paul only knew in part why do we think we know everything why is it that we can't learn something new and he says in verse 12 for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part I know in part tell your neighbor we only know in part only God knows everything and that is why brethren we must never we must never close our hearts and our minds to God he's always teaching us I made the point some time ago that in reading the word of the Lord and this was something that I read from the great uh, Dutch theologian G.C. Burkauer he said that um, in dealing with the Bible he says one must always be hearing listening he says uh, remembering is different when you remember you are thinking about something that you already know but he says the word of God is always fresh so you must come to listen because God will speak to you from a passage that you have read a hundred times and tell you something you didn't know before so when you come to the word of God you're not coming with memory you're coming to listen and sometimes brethren in our prayer we talk too much every one of us maybe we should listen we just talk too much we need to listen we need to spend most of our prayer time listening all right I'm, are you hearing me now all right so we're here to try to answer your questions on what we have covered so far concerning the doctrines of grace. And so looking at the doctrines of grace, we had first looked at an introduction. We tried to just say what we would be covering and um, what the doctrines of grace uh, mean for us and do for us then we looked at a definition of grace we considered what grace is and then we moved on to consider what grace does and we did that over three lessons then after that we looked at the sovereignty of God the fact that God is absolutely sovereign and no plan of his can be thwarted and that whatever he pleases to do he does and nobody can stop him we looked at the fact that God never has to resort to plan B never plan A always works Amen. And then we looked at the whole matter of, in lesson five, we looked at the will of man, the free will of man. We considered that. And we looked at the fact that man does have freedom of choice, but his freedom of choice is restricted by the fact that in his unsaved, unregenerate state, 
he does not have a desire to choose God. And in the final analysis, we said that we choose what is most important to us at the time of choosing the thing that we want the most and sometimes we excuse our sin and we say we really didn't want to do it that's not true at the moment when we sinned that is what we wanted to do most of all if it was not we wouldn't have done it amen, amen? amen. and then we looked at what we have termed the radical corruption of man which is tied to the whole matter of the free will or the so-called free will of man um, we looked at the fact that man in his lost unregenerate state is dead in trespasses and sins he has no desire for god he is dead in the same way that a person who is dead physically just has no physical life you could kick him you could box him you could spit in his face you could hurl abuse at him or her the response is going to be the same it's going to be no response and so it is with somebody who is spiritually dead when it comes on to the things of god no response until God intervenes so that is basically where we are and so um, brethren we'll try to answer any questions that you have on this these areas if you ask something outside of these areas we're just going to tell you to wait if it's relevant if 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 it's if it's relevant meaning it's part of the doctrines of grace We'll say to you, we'll come to that in a few more lessons. If it's something we're not touching on baptism now, if you want to ask about that or the Trinity or so, we won't be answering those questions. It's not a free-for-all session. You understand, brethren? <clears throat> All right. So, don't ask me how I was converted from Rastafarianism to come and get saved we're not asking those kind of questions we're not answering those kind of questions all right so does anybody have a question two one two all right i'm not testing i have a question sure go ahead sir <laughs> Um, in regards to free will, yeah. um, could you give a little more clarity on to when does God actually intervene versus when do we have our own choice? Because I've grown to understand that the Lord don't really operate a certain way. He will show you signs and things and you have to make the decision but based on the study up to last week we are seeing some different last week lesson eight okay yes we are seeing some things that probably we are not used to so if you could just give some clarity read the free will does he tell us where to go does he tell us what clothes to wear or he gives us a tugging and we have to make the decision all right when we talk about free will i'm not talking about decisions like what clothes you wear um, i'm talking about well let me start by saying man in his lost unregenerate state is dead he's dead and so being dead for him to appreciate spiritual things he has to be called from his state of deadness even as Lazarus was called from a state of deadness physically um, and I have made the point with Lazarus that Jesus did not ask Lazarus to cooperate with him 
he didn't really give Lazarus a choice. He didn't ask Lazarus to exercise his free will. He said to him, Lazarus, come forth. That was an imperative. That was the same voice that stood on the brink of time and said, let there be light. Light didn't have a choice. When God calls a sinner, the sinner does not have a choice. In the sense that what really happens is that God, by an exertion of his mighty power, makes that person willing to serve him. So that's what happens. We remember, brethren, we were at pains to say that the matter of when we say that man is dead in trespasses and sins, we're not saying, when we say that he's radically corrupt, we're not saying that he cannot do good works. And we looked at the passage where Jesus said to uh, the Jews of his time, you are evil and yet you know how to give good gifts to your children. And we looked at the fact too that uh, at the last day he said there would be those who came up to him and said, oh Lord, we preached in your name, we healed the sick in your name, we cast out devils in your name, and in your name we did many wonderful works. And he will say unto them, you're not telling the truth. Is that what he will say to them? No. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. Not that I knew you once, and you backslid, and I forgot about you. I never knew you. You were never in a saving relationship with me. You did all these things. Seemingly good works. But remember what we said, brethren. What is the motive behind these good works? Promotion of self, the ego. So, in terms of... You have to start from the premise... That man is dead in trespasses and sins. And so, when he uses his free will, he's free among the dead. He's like the man who is falling out of that plane, skydiving. And as long as he does not release the cord that will activate the parachute, he's falling and it could be exhilarating. There are, in his mind, no boundaries. He's having a wonderful time, but he's going down. And here's the thing, brethren. While he's going down, let him try to start going up again. And he finds out that his freedom is restricted. He's free only as far as it relates to him being pulled down. He's not free to go up. And if he does not pull the car to release the parachute, when he comes down, it's the last sensation he'll ever know. So those who are dead in trespasses and sins make choices. They make the choices that they want to make. And why is it they do not choose Christ? Because they do not want to choose Christ. Why do they not want to choose Christ? Because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. They that are the flesh's enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. And it cannot be. They that are in the flesh cannot. Please God, they cannot. And so we have to understand, brethren. See, we, 
we, we maybe have been persuaded that we can please God in the flesh. The good things that we do are pleasing to God. And I'm saying to us, they are filthy rags. They have no merit in terms of salvation. It's a roundabout answer, but I hope that I have helped to clear it up a little bit. So yes, we do have free will, but it is free. It is a restricted freedom. Very restricted. Yes, sister. Yes, please use the mic, brethren, so that everybody can benefit. Okay, as you were saying about the restrictive free will. Yes. I, 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 my mind went back to the Garden of Eden. Yes. When God said, you can eat of tree except. I don't know if he, would you say that's applicable to what he was just asking? And, and to what you were saying about the restriction of the freedom, you can eat of every tree except that one. So in a sense, I think we're not truly free as free. Because they have, God put boundaries on the freedom, as it were. But that is different though. Oh, okay. It is different in the sense, and if we go back to the last lesson we did the last, time we met we gave you a little chart you remember that little chart and we said Adam in the garden did he had freedom he had freedom to do good or to do evil and there was nothing that was present in Adam that prompted him to do evil Adam was not created with a sinful nature. There was nothing in Adam that motivated him to commit sin. So he, he was, in a sense, in a better shape than us because we do, are doing battle with something that is inherent in us, a fallen human nature that is, as Paul says, the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh lusteth. Adam did not know that. Adam never had that fight. The temptation that Adam and Eve faced came from outside, not from inside. We have to fight the flesh. They didn't have to fight the flesh. They had to fight the devil. We have to fight the devil and the flesh. And one of the things Jesus said when he was about to go to Calvary at the, near the ending of his supper with his disciples, he said, the prince of this world cometh, speaking of the devil, and he hath nothing in me. You and I can't say that. Jesus was saying, there's no groans that he can find in me. In other words, Jesus was really like Adam in that sense. He, if he wanted, he, he had his own will. And, and, and folks, that is really what makes the sin of Adam so tragic. Because you see, Adam could not say, you know, the flesh. In fact, Paul says the man was not deceived. Adam sinned knowing exactly what he was doing. That's what makes his fall so tragic. Nothing in him that impelled him to do it. After the fall in the garden, man, his choice is only a choice in the realm of the flesh. He's not operating in the spirit. He's in serious condition. His choices are downward. When we are saved, now we again have the ability to choose between good and evil. And not only do we have the ability to choose between good and evil, 
but we have now the divine nature imparted to us which paul says is giving us both the, the the giving us the energy to have a desire to do the will of god and the power to do it so folks when we sin we must not make excuses we are in much better shape than the person who is in the flesh person in the flesh cannot please god we are operating in the realm of the spirit if you have received the holy spirit you are operating in the realm of the spirit operating in the realm of the spirit means that god has imparted to you his divine nature you understand that brethren now and we have said that when the lord comes back he's going to constitute us in such a way that it will be impossible for us to sin we will be constituted in such a way that we will not have a desire to sin and it won't be possible for us to sin and and folks you can't do that for yourself no matter how you fast you can't do it for yourself god has to do that for you when he shall appear we shall be like him when he appears not before amen amen so so the freedom we're talking about is 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 because remember also last week we said that god you if you want to look at it you could say that god is restricted because the bible said god cannot lie and god cannot sin so there are some things that god cannot do but does that mean that god doesn't have freedom no god has absolute freedom and his freedom allows him not even to think about sin in fact in fact the bible said folks you have when you think of god you know you have to think of a being that doesn't even think an unrighteous thought you know it's difficult for us to conceive of that it's difficult for us to think that jesus could come on the earth and live for 33 years and never once he never even once saw a lady passing in a miniskirt and said you know some would that there with you in his mind never once and brethren men none of you in here can fool me and i wouldn't try to fool you you hearing me what i'm saying yes. yes you can tell me you can tell me that you have since you are saved you have never actually had a sexual relationship with a woman but you can't tell me that you never lost after a woman in your mind you can't tell me that not john mark not if you're all right <laughs> you brethren you might you might remember that some years ago one of our um one of our persons in politics he had said that from he was born he had never cursed a bad word and he had never told a lie and and one of the talk show hosts who was very popular at the time he's dead now um the next day he came on the radio and he said did you hear that statement from father teresa On a, on a lighter note brethren somebody told me that this story that some persons went to heaven and they 
behind Peter, you know, they said Peter is always at the gate of heaven. And they said that behind Peter were some very large clocks. And they said to Peter, what are those clocks? And he said, these are lie clocks. He said, when you, when you tell a lie, the hand move. And so they saw one where the hand had not moved far. And they said, who is that? And he said, that is the clock of Abraham Lincoln. He didn't tell very many lies. And they saw one where it had barely moved. And they said, whose clock is that? And he, Peter said, that is Mother Teresa. She didn't tell any lies. And the person said, you don't have any clocks of Jamaican politicians. <laughs> and Peter said, no, those are being used in hell for ceiling fans. <laughs> Now stop spin. <laughs> Brethren, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be sad if that was said about us? Brother Wayne. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, in one of your lessons, sir, you mentioned, according to what we have been taught, right? I've been mean, teach that um, the death, the burial, and the resurrection is the gospel of Christ. And you said in your lesson that a lot of apostolic preachers have not preached the gospel. Um, could you just explain yourself, sir? Um, first of all, contrary to, I guess, what maybe you have heard um, Acts 2.38 is not the gospel it is not the gospel Acts 2.38 is the answer to a question that was asked after the gospel was preached So, there are three or four um, actual sermons in the book of Acts. Um, it might be good for you to read those sermons because in none of those sermons is Acts 2.38 preached. Two of them were preached by Peter and two by Paul. At the end of one of Peter's sermons, the one on the day of Pentecost, he was asked a question after he had finished preaching, after he had stopped preaching the gospel, he was now asked what shall we do? We are convicted by the gospel message. What shall we do? Peter then said, this is what you must do. So it is the answer to the question that was asked, brethren. It is not the gospel. The gospel is the glorious news about Jesus Christ. What we must do is preach Christ. When we preach Christ and God works on the hearts of men and women, they will ask us what they should do. And then we tell them the answer. But we, we have preached Acts 2.38. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection. That's the gospel. Amen. Amen. Amen, brethren. Amen. And I say that without any fear. And I know I'm probably going against what you have heard, that the gospel... And, and, and one of our problems, one of our problems is that we are 
pushing Acts 2.38 down the throats of persons who have not asked us, men and brethren, what shall we do? Amen. Brethren, there are 37 verses before we come to 38. It is based on what happened in those 37 verses that the question was asked. But we are not allowing anything to happen. We are pouncing upon them. When a person is brought to conviction and they ask you, what shall we do? If you even tell them, go and bury yourself in a pit, they will do it. Because conviction has made them willing to do anything. If you just rush and tell them this, you might very well get opposition. That's why many people don't respond as they ought because we are trying to cow them down. We're not even Christ-like. See, part of it is just an arrogance that has been awakened in us because, as we say, we have the truth. So we have the truth. So the whole of you are idiot. You have to hear when me say, and me have the truth. Good night, everyone. Okay, I have two questions. Ask me one first. Yes. I'm slow of speech, but also slow of mind. Okay. Um, the Bible said that after Adam sinned, then sin was automatically imputed on every human being. Yes. Every human being. That where was... you where you find that? I don't remember the specific scripture. All right. Romans chapter five. Okay. But you are right. So, Adam sinned and every human being automatically inherited a sinful nature. Yes. They didn't, we didn't have a choice. No. So, why is it that when Jesus came and he died, that it wasn't automatic that all of us inherited a godly nature? Why is it that only some humans are going to be selected by him for this salvation? And the other question is basically... Let me answer that question first. <laughs> My answer to your question is, I don't know. I don't know why he has only decided to elect some. I don't know why he went to the pool and just healed the one man when there was a multitude of sick people. He has not told us why, and the scriptures have not told us why. I don't know why. There are some things that are in the secret counsels of God. I want to read a scripture for you with that in mind. And it is Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 says, uh, Romans 11, yes, verse 33 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So it may be, it may be that when we get to heaven, that even this God may reveal it unto us. And we will have an understanding. One more scripture on that. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. This is a scripture that we must try to remember, brethren. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So there are some things Moses says, they are secret, they belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us. Thank you. Okay, so the second thing I wanted to ask, you basically said that God has to select um, the persons who he will call that we can accept the message of salvation. 
that without that calling that a sinner or a person cannot be saved so then how then can he judge the persons who did not get the call if they die and go to hell is it that he didn't choose to call them and how can they be judged if they were helpless every human being that is born think about this what is the wage of sin death but David says we were born in sin we were shaped in iniquity Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were by nature by nature the children of wrath even as others why are we no longer the children of wrath because there is a but God who is rich in mercy so every human being if God does not intervene we are all on our way to hell God does not have to send anybody to hell what God does is to prevent some people from going to hell but every human being and 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 Romans chapter 9. Let's go there. L let me show you something. Go to Ro yes, Where are you? You're you tired, eh? All right, don't worry about it. Romans chapter 11 first. Let me just show you something here. Look at verse 7. Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Paul says, What then? Israel, speaking of Israel as a nation, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it. There are some people who are part of Israel who have obtained it. The nation hasn't obtained it, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were what? Blinded. The rest were blinded. Now the question is, who was responsible for their blindness? Was it them, or was it God? That's the question. Is there an answer? Let's read on. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. God. So Paul is raising this matter. And we would now begin to say, Paul could never say that God is the one who has blinded them. But without hesitation, Paul says, it is God who has done so. Hmm? Can we fully understand that, brethren? We can't. Look at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. God hath blinded Israel so that he can bring in the Gentiles. But don't worry, after the Gentiles are coming, Israel will be okay. Listen to this. Listen to this. So, 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 so. Uh, look at this now, brethren. Let's go to Romans 9. So, so, God is responsible for blinding some of Israel. Again, remember, we mentioned 
uh, this passage in Matthew where our Lord he was our Lord grew up in Nazareth he was he was a Galilean even though really he was born in 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 Judah he was born in Judea he was born in Bethlehem of Judea and by the way Bethlehem wasn't even a large city you know Bethlehem wasn't I mean Bethlehem wasn't but anyhow he was born in Bethlehem but he grew up in Galilee and between Judea and Galilee there was Samaria Galilee Judah is to the south and Galilee was to the north and Samaria was somewhere in the middle if you can think about that in your mind so but Jesus his 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 ministry was in large portion in Galilee and he said to some of the cities he said no he said woe unto thee Chorazin one of the towns in Galilee woe unto thee Bethsaida if the mighty works that had been done in you had been done in and Sidon they would have repented and been in sackcloth now the question brethren is to me this is fascinating Jesus said if I had done the things that I had done in you if I had done them in Tyre and Sidon they would have repented he's saying they would have and if Jesus says they would have, they would have. The question is, if you know that if you had done it there, they would have repented, why didn't you? Why did you do it to people who you knew would not repent? Romans 9. Romans 9 really uh, let's go from verse 10 and we're going to use this passage a lot it's seminal and not only this but when Rebecca also had conceived by one even by our father Isaac for the children being not yet born the children being what? not yet born neither having done any good or evil Paul didn't have to state, to state that because if they were not yet born they couldn't have done good or evil but he's saying it for emphasis but why does he say that? why doesn't he just say the children being not yet born? why does he say the obvious neither having done any good or evil if you're not born you can't do good or evil why does he say that why does he say that Paul tells us that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth Paul says why God did this was to demonstrate that he makes his choice based on his election it is that is his purpose his purpose listen it was said unto her the elder shall serve the younger contrary to the way things are normally done even in the law of God the eldest child is the one who receives the greater part of the inheritance that's why when you read the story of the prodigal son you mustn't have any sympathy on the older brother when he said um, I have served you all these years and you haven't given even me a kid to celebrate with my friends wicked 
he's wicked because the Bible says when hardcore When the younger son came, when the younger son came and said, Give me the inheritance that falleth to me, the Bible says he divided unto them his living unto them. So that elder brother got his share, which was more than the younger brother. He was wicked because he didn't have to spend his money at all because he was living off daddy. If you want to celebrate with your friends, you know, take your money and buy a boat. Anyhow. Anyhow. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that now God goes against that standard practice and he says, the elder shall not be first. The elder shall serve the younger. The elder shall serve the younger. God is saying, listen, I'm doing this to demonstrate it has nothing to do with them. Now, folks, wouldn't Esau have a right to say, that is unfair. Why you choose him? Why? We're not finished. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What's the obvious question to ask after that? The obvious question is what Paul asked. Paul, Paul asked the question. He knows that when people read this, they are going to say, what is this? Paul asks the question that he knows the people are going to ask. A good teacher always anticipates the question that his audience is going to ask. What then? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? This seems to be unrighteous. This not seem to be fair. And folks, if you want God to be fair... If you want God to be fair, listen, if you really want God to be fair, you are asking for justice. And trust me. You like it. You like it. <laughs> have you ever read The Merchant of Venice? You have read it? I've often said to people that if you ever find yourself not being able to get a Bible by the complete works of Shakespeare, is the closest thing. Is the closest thing. Shakespeare never, not once, not once. Well, let me not say that. He wrote over 30 plays, and I have not read them all. But I've read more than 20. And never does he ever speak about God or Christianity except with the deepest reverence. Deepest reverence. I, I'm not saying that the man was saved, you know. I'm just telling you that. He, he in Macbeth, some of you have read Macbeth and you might have seen it. He, when the king's sons were not behaving better one of the lords reprimanded them and said thy royal father was a most sainted king the queen that bore thee oftener upon her knees than on her feet more often on her knees than on her feet in merchant of venice though you know that scene where the lawyer portia is representing Antonio and Shylock is saying I want my pound of flesh and she said to him you need to be merciful and 
And Shylock says, what must compel me to be merciful? And she said, the quality of mercy is not strained. No, it, mercy can't be compelled. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. It is mightiest in the mightiest. But then she goes on to say, in the, though justice is what you want, know this, that in the course of justice, none of us would see salvation. In the course of justice, none of us would see salvation. So when you say God is not fair, it is not fair for God to save you because you don't deserve it. But if God was just to you, you wouldn't see salvation. Trust me, brethren. Is there unrighteousness with God? Paul said, no. Perish the thought. Why? For he had already said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I... So folks, if God was going to have mercy on everybody, there would be no need for him to say this. If he was going to have compassion on everybody, he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So then, it is not of him that willeth. It does not depend on the person who desires it. Nor of him that runneth. It doesn't depend on your, the efforts that you make. But of God which showeth mercy. For... The scripture says that Paul is going into deep things now. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God is saying to Pharaoh, the only reason why you are on the throne is so that I can get glory. I want my name to be published throughout all the earth. And that is why you are a king. Have nothing to do with you. Have everything to do with me. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And whom he will he harden it. Paul again says, I'm in trouble. That was a rough thing I said. And he said, I know the question. Thou wilt say to me, why doth he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? What is Paul saying? Paul, Paul's readers are saying, Paul is anticipating that his readers will ask, well, if God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens others, why am vexed with anybody then? Is it a reasonable question? It is a reasonable question. Do you expect that it should be given a reasonable answer? Huh? What kind of answer do you think Paul should say now? The question is, if he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and if he has compassion on whom he wants to have compassion, and if he hardens who he wants to harden, why is he upset with anybody? We are only doing what he causes us to do. What should be the answer? Well, I don't know what should be the answer. I can tell you what is the answer. Nay. No. Paul is saying to them, you're going into a depth that you cannot swim in. You've gone into the secret things now that not revealed. No, but oh man, who are you? Paul is saying, who in the world do you think you are? That you are replying against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, 
Why hast thou made me thus? Can the thing that is made say to the maker, I don't like the way you make me? Paul said, who are you? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Paul is saying, folks, I'm sorry, I just have to tell you what the Bible says. Even if it is difficult to digest, Paul is saying God has the right to do anything he wants with any one of us. He has the right because we belong to him. He made us. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you, oh, God treats everybody the same. God is fair. But the Bible does not say that. And Brother John cannot go beyond the Bible to make anybody feel good. It is rough, folks. It, you don't think I, it is rough for me? Listen to what Paul says in verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, what does God want to do? What does he want to show? His wrath and make his power known. What if God endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What does that word fitted mean? Prepared. Prepared for destruction. And that he might make known the riches. Sorry, endured with, yes, much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy so there are vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared afore prepared prepared for what unto glory even us whom he had called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Remember, folks, on Sunday we mentioned the building of Solomon's temple. The stones were afore prepared. That's, that's, you, you have taken me out of my, out of, I, I, I plan to deal with this when we deal with the great subject of election. Is that next? No, we have one more thing to do on the radical corruption. But after that, we'll probably look at election. So really, that is it, brethren. God has the right. God has the right. God. And brethren, when we... When, when, when God brings everything to an end, everybody's going to understand why God, and, and nobody will have any complaints. Nobody will be able to say God. And, and remember what we all have kept saying. There are some persons who receive justice. And there are some who receive grace. Nobody receives injustice. Everybody who goes to hell deserves to go. Let me say it this way. We have said this before. Ten men guilty of murder. 
under the same circumstances, they are all sentenced to death by hanging. I'm using that extreme. Please don't go away and say, Pastor Bartlett, say hanging should be resumed. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it should or should not be. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you a scenario. So there are these ten men. At the end of his tenure, the governor decides to pardon one of them. You know that that happens in the United States. The president, when he's coming to the end, or the governor, they will just pardon one person. And it's not that the person is not guilty, you know. President or the governor just decide to pardon one. So tell me now, if one of those ten is pardoned, the nine who are not pardoned, when they are hung, when they are being taken out to be hung, can they say that this is unjust? Are they, did they commit the crime? Were they sentenced to die? Yes. What can be their complaint? The only complaint they can have is that they didn't get picked. They can't say that any injustice was shown. The one who was reprieved, can he boast and point to anything good that he did Why he was Brethren, have you ever thought what was in the mind of Barabbas when he heard the soldiers coming down to his cell? When he heard them coming, these, these soldiers coming down to his cell, he must have said, me, a dead, me dead now. You can imagine when they said to him, you are free. couldn't even believe it how, how, how somebody is taking your place you know what the word you know what the name Barabbas means son of the father serious that's what it means son of the father it was the son of the father that took the place of the son of the father Oh my. I, I'm, maybe I should say this, brethren. Sister Lorena can go to the microphone. Maybe I should say this. I, said, I think I said before that I could not explain it to one question. I said, I don't know the answer. And, and maybe I went on to say, to, to explain that secret things belong to God and all the depths up but maybe I want to qualify that brethren and say it quite possible that somebody who is more learned than me could have given a better answer I want to say that I, I want to say I could not <laughs> yes sister Laurie yes sir this is this is really what I hold, hold it down lady Laurie Coming to you, Brother Rommel. Yes. This is really what I want to ask you, sir. Um, based on what the young the sister asked, yes. I would like to hear her question again because I'm looking at Romans 5. And yes. To me, it, it seems to have a balance sheet effect. So Come on, let us go there. Yes, I think we should look at it. So the sister, Romans 5. Yes, the sister who asked the question about... Yes. Talk to her. She comes to the mic. Okay. The question I had asked was that if all humans were automatic all humans automatically got a sinful nature because yes. Adam sinned. Right. So why is it that when Jesus died we didn't automatically inherit a godly nature? Ah. Uh. Then, sir, you, did you quote a scripture? What? But the, the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, 
in and of itself would not have guaranteed us a godly nature. It, it, However, you asked her if she knows where that was found. Yes. And you said Romans 5. five. Yes. So we need to look at Romans 5. I need to understand something here. Tell me where, what you need to understand. Which verse particularly? Sorry, several verses in us. Let me have the time to go through them. That's why we are here. Yes, yeah, she did. She quoted a verse and you said you don't. Which verse you quoted? Yeah, you made the quotation. I, I think I told her Romans 5. Yeah, she said something and you said you know it is found and she said she don't remember. Right. And then you told her Romans 5. Yes. Yes, the first question. But, all right. But what I'm seeing here. Brethren. What I'm seeing here is Hold your peace. Four, as by one man tell me which verse you are at verse 12 sir yes wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world yes and death by sin yes and so death passed unto all men yes and that all have sinned yes right for unto the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law yes nevertheless death reigned from adam to moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression is the figure of him that was to come. Yes. So this is it now. But not as the offense, so also is a free gift. Yes. So I'm seeing a balance here, sir. So she was asking why, like the sin passed to all, but by the spiritual yes in the past to all and right. because you mentioned romans i'm seeing here it is said for if through the offense of one yes many be dead yes much more the grace of god yes. and the gift of grace which is by one man yes. jesus christ hath abounded unto many yes no <laughs> brethren no no brethren Brethren, don't be quick to say that. Let, let us read through. Let us read through. It's very and important. Not, and not as it was by one that sinned. Yes. So is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Yes. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which receive abundance by grace See that? and they of the which, gift. Hold on, Sister Lorene. Don't pass that. They which receive abundance of grace. Paul is making a qualifying statement there. One man's offense, death reign by one. Much more they which receive abundance of grace. So that is, there are some who receive abundance of grace. Not all. But read on, read on, it's important. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Yes. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Yes. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous. Yes. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but we are sin abound, grace is much more abound. Yes. So, I don't really understand. Sir, okay. So. Okay. So, let's that's why we read Romans. So, what Paul is saying is that the sentence of death was passed unto. Uh, let me say this, brethren, before. I think it's very important. Because we, don't, we, we must not be impatient when questions are being asked. Because sometimes we do not understand what is in the mind of the questioner. And sometimes when the question is asked, it even helps us by the explanation to have a greater understanding and listen, brethren, 
I'm just going to be very honest with you. If I cannot answer, I'm going to tell you that I can't answer right now. I'll come back to and tell you, you know. I, I, I'm not above that. Okay? So, so these questions are important and we must be patient. Okay, so, so when, when Adam fell, all of us fell in Adam. Death passed to all men. We all inherited the sinful human nature and we all carry with us the disease of sin. Jesus Christ came and you have to understand a little bit about the correlation between Adam and Jesus Christ. So, both of them were called sons of God. They were called the son of God. And there are similarities and differences between them. One of the similarities is that both of them, well, Adam was created. Adam was not born except, well, maybe you could say that the ground was his mother. But he, he did not have a sinful human nature. And similarly, Jesus Christ was born without a sinful human nature. So they, so they were parallel. Adam brought us into a fallen state and relinquished man's position of dominance in a garden by saying in effect not thy will but my will be done Jesus Christ reversed the curse so to speak and brought back man's dominance in another garden by saying not my will but thine be done notice one was in the garden of Eden and one in the garden of Gethsemane. And so, when that happened now, when that happened, man was able to, he became redeemable. Let us put it that way. But now, out of all those who have, who are dead in trespasses and sins, it is not automatic that all those become alive. It is those whom God has called, as verse 17 intimated to us. And that's why I stopped Sister Lorene and asked her to read it again. It is those whom God has called that are now the beneficiaries of this eternal life which Jesus procured. Not all men. So we, when, we, when we are born, we automatically inherit Adam's sin. But the death of Jesus Christ does not mean that every human being automatically inherits eternal life. Because one of the very controversial points that we are going to look at when we look at this is for whom did Jesus die? For whom did Jesus die? That's going to be something that we will have to take some time over. I don't want to preempt what he did say. Well, he said the, 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 in John chapter 10, he, he said to the Jews, well, they said to him, if, if you are the Christ, Stop beating around the bush. Just tell us plainly that you are Messiah. And he said, I've told you. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. That's why you don't believe. Why you don't believe? Because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. So you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They believe me. You don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. The good shepherd giveth his life for. Anyhow, don't let that trouble you too much now. We're going to come to that. Um, let me show you something that just might 
story and, and I, I won't give you the answer because I don't really know the answer. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Look at verse 6. I'm going to ask you a question. I, and I'm going to ask you to do some homework and tell me what you come up with. It's an old cell phone that the ring sound like them old time phone. <laughs> Where you stuff it to some dial weird. You remember those phones? You have to dial everything. When you dial the zero, your finger burn you. I hope you don't think I disrespected the phone, you know. John chapter 17, verse 6. Listen now. Jesus is speaking. And, and, and folks, the truth is that he's speaking to his father. And some of us apostolics get nervous with this. But Jesus had a father. And we must not be afraid any longer to use biblical language. The Bible said God sent his son. We mustn't be afraid to say God sent his son. Because that's what the Bible said. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them thy words which thou gavest me. Here Jesus is saying to them, it's not even my words. It's the words that you, Father, gave me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. I'm sorry. Jesus did not pray for everybody. Is not Bartlett said this, you know. I pray not for the world. Who, am, who do I pray for? For them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I don't have no prayer to waste. I am praying for those that you have given me. Because it don't make no sense I pray for those who you have not given me. I pray not for the world. Is that tough? Yes. It, that's not the real question. Is it biblical? Well, if it's tough and biblical, deal with the toughness. Brethren, brethren, there, there are things that we have just accepted, you know, without probing. At least let us probe. Brother Rommel. Yes, Lord, everyone. Yes, sir. With regards to free will. To? Free will. Free will. Is a mention in Genesis yes. that uh, Adam had the ability to choose yes. between good and evil. Yes. Then you mentioned that in the church age, when we have come in contact with God and we have received the grace of God, yes. we can also choose between good and evil. Yes. So I'm looking at the various dispensations, such as Abraham and the time of the law and so forth. Did they also, at what point, did they have the ability to choose between good and evil? Is it that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you have the free will to do, to choose? Okay, so, so now, let's look at, again at Romans 11. Well, let's look at Abraham first. And, and you're going to take me into something that I'm going to deal with again at length when we deal with election. It's either Genesis 18 or 19. I mentioned it one Sunday in passing.
All right. Let's let's start at verse 16. Genesis 18, verse 16. You remember that at a certain time, three men came to visit with Abraham. We know that God was one, and we assume that the other two were angels, and I believe that that is a correct assumption. So I say that because verse 16 says, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. Those men would have been referring to the two angels. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him Verse 19, brethren, where it says, For I know him that he will command his children. The Hebrew, you know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, right? The Hebrew says, For I have known him in order that he will command his children. And when we deal with it at the appropriate time, I'm going to show you, several passages, several translations of the Bible where that, and, and the Hebrew is unmistakable. It literally says, I have known him so that, or I have known him in order that. And that knowledge is not just talking about foreknowledge. It is talking about a saving relationship, an intimate knowing. It is the same word that is used um, euphemistically and Adam knew his wife and she became pregnant you understand what it means when you say he knew her it no mean that him looking into our face and say you know I know that your name is Eve you, you understand brethren little children are here and we have to be careful so but even little children know more than some of us <laughs> next, next thing again so so so, so folks, it was God's knowing of Abraham that guaranteed that Abraham would command his children after him. What am I saying? I am saying that God's method of entering into saving relationship with men has never changed. He has always elected. It is by, based on his election let us, and, and, and so we're going to go to Romans 11. And we'll see it demonstrated there. This is what happens to men in the old covenant. Let's go from verse 1, Romans 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, or know you not what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone? And they seek my life. But what said the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men 
who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. How, how have, why have these men not bowed the knee to Baal? Because I have reserved them to myself. It didn't originate with them. I have reserved them to myself. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant based on what? According to the election of grace. What did Noah find in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. It is always God reserving to himself. And that, you notice Paul in writing Romans 9, which we read, he does not bring it, he does not bring to bear any New Testament figure on it. He goes to the Old Testament and says, Moses, from Moses' time, God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I, that's, that's, brethren, what we need to understand is that salvation is not man's prerogative. I'm sorry. Salvation is solely the prerogative of God. Hard lesson to learn. Hard lesson to learn. But the scriptures clearly teach this. Salvation is God's prerogative. So, Let's ask a fundamental question, brethren. Any man, Old Testament man or New Testament man, how can they live righteously except by God? Can, 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 could the Old Testament, it's, it's a serious question, could the Old Testament man please God by his own works? Hmm. It is in the Old Testament that Isaiah said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Couldn't please God. Except their work. Isaiah in Isaiah, Isaiah said, all, all our works, you have wrought them in us. The good works that we have done, you have wrought them in us. Let me show you an example of this, brethren, because even, even things that... Let me just show you. 1 Corinthians 15. And, and we see the dichotomy in, in this uh, passage here. Paul, in chapter 15, he starts out... And he, he begins to give a, a little history of what happened after the Lord was resurrected. And he's saying, he says, look at, let's pick up at verse 4. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, Peter. Then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That means they died, right? It don't mean they're going to a coma. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that I'm not meet or I'm not deserving to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by what? By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in, me, in vain. Listen to this now. But I labored. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet 
not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul said it was really me laboring. It was the grace of God that was with me. God was the one that gave me the grace to labor. It didn't inhere in me. And brethren, from Old Testament to New, we can only please God based on his grace. Let us go to Exodus chapter 33. Now, this is a very dangerous little passage because it's when the children of Israel sinned by reason of the golden calf and Moses is interceding. Verse 12 of Exodus 33. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Because God had said to him previously, I'm not going with you. Yet, thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found, what? Grace. That's what God said to Moses. You have found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that, that I may find grace in thy sight you already said find grace but moses said that i might find and consider that this nation is thy people and he said my presence shall go with thee and i will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us not up hence for wherein shall it be known here that i and thy people have found what grace in thy sight is it not if thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all people that are upon the face of the earth. Brethren, it is the grace of God that separates people from people. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. Why? For thou hast found grace in my sight. And I know thee by name. This is why men in the Old Testament were able to live for God. Because they found grace in his sight. And you notice that, you notice that um, Moses in verse 16 says, The people have found grace in thy sight. That's the only way it can work. Brethren, it has to be that way. Remember that, remember that God said to these people, you know, when Moses, they were ready to enter the promised land, Moses said to them, I, I need to find it for you. Am I taking too long in answering this one question? You're saying no, but somebody's saying yes. But, but they are silent. Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm going to show you how the... Brethren, you see when your eyes are open, you're going to find election all over the Bible. It's going to happen to you. Trust me on that. It's all over the Bible. Even in places that you hardly can look for it. Verse 6, Exodus, Deuteronomy 7. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee. You are not a special people because there is anything special about you. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee 
to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. Because the Lord loved you. No reason could Moses give for why the Lord loved them. He just said the Lord loved you and he chose you. You, are, you weren't, Moses was kind when he said you are the fewest of all people. They were not a people. They did not exist. And God brought them from two people that were barren. Because God wanted to demonstrate it has nothing to do with your works. What you produce with your works, I rejected him. I am bringing a child by my works. And that's why I wait till you, Sarah, reach men of stop. And you, Moses, and you, Abraham, dead. Sister Annette said, men are dead. <laughs> Brethren, that's how it works. God must get glory. If Ishmael was chosen, Abraham would have said, me do that. But when God said to him, after Ishmael was born, you, you and Sarah are going to have a child. Moses laughed. It wasn't them little giggling, you know. He laughed that God here. You <laughs> said, I want this. Me and Sarah, two dead people, figure have a picnic. And the Lord said, Okay. Good. You laugh. When the child is born, call him Isaac. Isaac means laughter. God said, I never go. Anytime you call him name, I want you to remember you did laugh at me. But I want you to know this has nothing to do with you. you. You can never boast. Because Paul says, if you, have, you, have you been reading the daily Bible reading? You read Galatians. Galatians 4 said, one of them was the child of promise. But the Lord loved you. Listen now, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1. I'm going to close this with this. Oh my. You know, I thought it was about 7.30. Honestly, honestly. Serious. You want us just pretend that it's 7 30? <laughs> Listen, all right. Brethren, honestly, I didn't know. Look, look at Deuteronomy 9. Hero Israel. Moses again talking to them. Thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go and to possess nations. Listen, brethren. Listen, listen, you cannot read these things and don't pay attention. Thou art to go in and possess nations greater and mightier than thyself. How are you going to do it if they're greater and mightier than you? you? I am telling you that they are greater and mightier than you. How are you going to do it? You can't do it except by the grace of God. Cities great and fenced up to heaven. A people great and tall, the children of the Anakim, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? God says, that saying is among you. You have heard people say, nobody can stand up to the children of the Anakim. How are you going to do it? Greater nations than you try. Understand, therefore, this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth 
over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. He shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee saying for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me into possess this land but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Moses is saying to them, you don't deserve it. And never once let me hear you boast. Because if it was for deserving alone, you wouldn't stand at your stiff neck. And then the other verses, now he goes on to rehearse to them. Remember this? Remember that? Remember that? Brethren, from day one, all God wants is for the people that he has redeemed to give him glory. And to acknowledge is not me. I have nothing to do with it. All glory to you. I didn't contribute nothing. I could not have defeated these people. Is you bring them down before my face. Brethren, I, I tell you the truth right now. I I am I I am I am saying to the Lord, I'm in your hand. Do anything you want with me. Don't matter to me. Don't matter to me. Up or down. Just use me for your glory. Yes. So, you know. Yes. Brethren, nothing that's happening around don't scare me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. Yeah, so, brethren, we... we we, we will schedule more of these question and answer sessions because they are helping me when you question me and I explain to you the thing become more cemented in me you know Amen. yes and so and, and also there are points that I'm going to have to go and check to, to solidify it a little more let's stand um, brethren let's, let's give all those who ask questions a handy because they are braver than some more of us, see? It's not that the rest of us do have questions, you know. But, but, but sometimes we are a little bit scared. Isn't it true? Time. All right, all right, time. All right. So, so brethren... You, you see, the time is late, so we're not going to answer no private questions afterward, you know. No, Next time, you hear? All right. Ushers, come quickly, please. Let's pray, brethren. Our God and our Father, who is like unto thee, Again, Lord, we are in awe of your grace. Again, Lord, when we contemplate that you have chosen us, we wonder and we are led to ask why. Because we are conscious that it was not anything that was good in us that led you to choose us we are
baffled Lord because deep in our hearts if we were choosing by deserving maybe we wouldn't even have chosen ourselves because Lord we know of other people who just by their natural way of living probably deserve it more than us we are deeply grateful to you for your grace we are humbled by your grace we are broken by your grace we are torn in pieces by your grace your grace causes us to want to throw ourselves on you more and more and say oh god help me for i am poor and weak all the day long it has been you jesus from start to finish you are the author and you are the completer of our faith we thank you lord thank you for the questions that have been asked and for the attempt to answer and we know, Lord, that the answers given were not complete and were not as good as they could have been if maybe somebody else were here. And certainly, Lord, not if you were here and not as it is going to be when we see you face to face. And there will always be more questions than answers. But we pray, O oh God, that something has been said, maybe as a result of a question asked. Maybe the very question itself would have spurred somebody to think. And maybe one or two of the answers would have done that. Help us, Lord, to press on to seek your face for greater illumination. We hesitate to say revelation, Lord, because the truth has been revealed in your word. But illuminate the truth to us, Lord. Open our eyes, lighten our eyes, Lord, and help us to see. Take away from us spiritual glaucoma and help us, Lord, to bring a freshness to the word and a mind that is ready to learn. Help us not to think that we know it all already. And to help us to understand, Lord, that there is way more about you that we do not know than that we know. We are still scratching the surface. And help us, Lord, not to be arrogant. And arrogance, Lord, can be so concealed it can come across as humility. But Lord, we could operate as if our way is the only way things should be done. And any deviation from our way is wrong. If we sing it any other way, it's wrong. If we clap hands any other way, it's wrong. If we administrate any other way, it's wrong. Help us to see that that is not of God. And nobody owns a franchise. Nobody has a corner on you. We're all just scratching the surface. The offering that will be received tonight, Lord, may it be used for your honor and glory. We are apologizing, Lord, to you for keeping your people over time which we did not do deliberately we ask you to forgive us some have far to go we commit ourselves into your hands in jesus name grace and peace be with your brethren the lord bless you come and give an offering Friend. Remember to plan for Sunday evening, eh? 5.30 to 8 o'clock. All right? Our first Sunday gathering. 
is not really a service. We have some business to take care of and we'd like for everybody to come. All right?